Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well and that you're all having a, a wonderful day. And without any further ado, uh, let's jump right into it. So while the cryptocurrency market has been acting extremely weird, for those of you who did not see the, I think it was a day or two ago, the video that I made as to why the market was acting so weird, you might want to have a gander simply because it's very important. On on top of that, one of the, and I mean, it's, it's a constant cycle. This isn't anything new. This isn't like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about kind of, kind of thing. Uh, there's a constant trend. I don't pay attention to other markets that much, but I know this is a major trend within the cryptocurrency space where... When prices are going up, and I mean like pumping daily, the cryptocurrency market is relatively euphoric, and we know that rich people are buying uh, within the market or trying to gain access to the market, what have you. There's always something. Um, however, the inverse is uh, when prices are going down and or have stagnated or simply aren't moving as people expect them to. Normal people tend to slow down their buying, and rich people continue to buy at the exact same rate. There's really no actual difference. So this is where I think we currently are right now, and this is what, personally, from what I've seen from the last couple of market cycles, uh, ends up instilling this um, this level of FOMO for for a lot of people within the market because they realize that they could have been buying, but they chose not to do so. So, I mean, this happened and then it also resolved itself very, very quickly. So you'll see. Uh, Morgan Stanley, one of the world's largest investment banks with over $1.4 trillion in assets under management. It's really weird that we have numbers like that. And it's kind of like very blase now that we have like multi-trillion dollar companies. It, it seems like it should be more news, but okay. Morgan Stanley is reportedly considering <clears throat> allowing its brokers to directly recommend Bitcoin ETFs to their customers. We've gotten a lot of news that since the launch of the ETF, there's been a lot of interest in them. From a lot of companies and institutions, but there's a really weird thing in the institutional world where you kind of have to be allowed and or let people be able to offer these products to their clients. Otherwise, you can do it, but you're not really supposed to and you can maybe get in trouble if you actually end up doing it. And this is kind of what we're talking about <clears throat> at the moment. This is why we saw a, a really weird shift. The first couple of weeks after the ETFs ended up launching, uh, the news that we got is that a number of larger institutions basically came forward and said, no, we're not going to be offering anything Bitcoin because Bitcoin's too volatile and it goes against uh, our practices of investing. And they subsequently ended up losing a number of people who were using their platform who simply just went somewhere else. So now Morgan Stanley is also discussing the idea of potentially trying to offer this to their clients simply because I'm pretty sure they're getting calls and people are like, hey, I've been doing business with you for a while. I'd rather not move my money. Can you simply start offering this? I don't know why there's such a huge gap here, like with no words. I'm scrolling down. It doesn't look like it, but there's just no, why is there such a huge gap here? Who made this article? The move comes... After the successful launch of Bitcoin spot ETFs in the U.S., <clears throat> Morgan Stanley has been positive about Bitcoin since the approval of Bitcoin ETFs, and the bank opened up Bitcoin ETF purchases to its clients shortly after their launch. However, until now, these purchases have only been available on an unsolicited basis, okay, meaning that brokers could not actively pitch the products to their clients. The potential change in policy would mean or enable Morgan Stanley brokers to recommend Bitcoin ETFs to their customers proactively. So this news came out, and like I said, it was it was solved rather rather quickly. Uh, Morgan Stanley has now filed a submission with the U.S. SEC to permit the exposing of Bitcoin ETF 
to about a dozen of their investment firms. The firms include, I'm not reading all those names, it's way too many names. As per the filing, these funds will achieve indirect exposure to Bitcoin by investing in Bitcoin ETFs with Pacific caps to manage the exposure. So two things are happening. Um, you are now, or rather Morgan Stanley workers are now going to be able to offer Bitcoin ETFs to their customers solicitedly uh, without having to worry about any any type of backlash. But they're also listing with the SEC to actually gain exposure to Bitcoin and a lot of their other funds as well. Here's the tweet for it right here. <clears throat> it says, Justin Morgan Stanley has filed with the SEC to get Bitcoin ETF exposure for 12 of their funds, soon to be sold by 15,000 plus of their brokers. Um, I guess while not the most exciting news, <clears throat> sorry, just woke up. It, it's a thing. And while not the most exciting news, I, I think stuff like this is very important as far as like the larger picture kind of thing. And I say this simply because I'm, I'm noticing the, like the shift in attitude once again by a lot of people who are within the market. I've been seeing it on Twitter for like, a, I mean, just in general, if, if things don't go the way that people assume that things are going to go immediately, there's always like a bit of like a sadness that kind of rolls through the cryptocurrency space. It's very, very weird. But then the other side of that as well is like, if you're in this market, I would assume that you are here for the long term. I'm sure someone just shook their head no, well, I can't really help you then. But the other part of it is that these, these companies, these ETFs, Morgan Stanley... They're not here for a year and a half. These companies are gaining exposure to Bitcoin, the same as other ETFs, and also buying up Bitcoin for the next 100 years. So this is going to be a relatively slow process, and I, and I say slow in air quotes as far as like it may take us around 22 years in total to hit a million dollars per Bitcoin but it's still that kind of thing where I notice that people who are in the cryptocurrency space become very, very antsy, very quick. <clears throat> While the slow but rapid accumulation of Bitcoin by these large funds in these institutions continues more and more every single day. So just always keep that in mind whenever you may lose heart that the rich people are constantly buying all the time. There's also whale news. I thought it redundant to bring it to the video. It's just more of a, yes, the whales are still buying. I have to sneeze and it's driving me absolutely insane. It just won't go away. Oh boy. Is it going to now? Is it happening? Nope. Also, <coughs> there we go. Thank you for those of you who said bless you. Um, yeah, since the beginning of the video, I was like, can you just please not sneeze? And my, my brain was like, no, this is going to happen. Yeah, that's the quick Morgan Stanley news. I guess it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Rich people are still buying, and they probably always will. Let's move on. Also in the news, Binance has announced the successful completion of their 27th quarterly Binance Coin token burn. According to the announcement, BNB tokens worth, jeez Louise, $1.17 billion have been removed from the market. The burn of 1.9 million BNB tokens is uh, what just recently took place. Binance Coin has not been in the news as much as it used to, but it's funny that it's once again popping up. This was a more popular trend in 2019, 2020, and parts of 2021, where basically, for those of you who do not know, uh, Binance um, basically, of course, has their own token. But part of the gimmick, if you will, of the coin is that they had... 200 million of them, and they are trying to burn until they only have 100 million. If you were here years ago, when I say it was like really in the news, a lot of financial news outlets used to talk about Binance Coin as if it was like, I'm not even a joke, like the next Tesla or the next Amazon because of how large Binance is uh, compared to other crypto exchanges, how much money they get flowing through them. And I mean, if we heard that Amazon 
or Apple had their own coin or dollar kind of thing, and they were just literally throwing it into a furnace, making it rarer and rarer. The idea is that Binance, with this continued growth, will be one of the largest companies on the planet, and I mean it already is. So every quarter, they burn a bunch of coins. I forgot how the allocation is done, but it, it, it lessens the supply. We see the... Oh my gosh, my arm. Oh boy. We, we see the... Um, the, the circulating supply lesson and also subsequently, even if there is not a lot of market activity within the entire cryptocurrency space, we will see sometimes that Binance's coin actually ends up going up in price because of its usage uh, on their Binance platform. And it's 27th token, 27 already. Time is flying. Jeez Louise. Binance continued to support the BNB by burning a massive amount of tokens, burns occur in quarterly periods. BNB is the cryptocurrency that fuels the Binance chain ecosystem. BNB Smart Chain, OP, BNB, L2S, okay. And BNB Greenfield? Never heard of that in my entire life. BNB Greenfield Blockchain. Okay. It also serves as a governance token, allowing its holders to transact with projects built on these chains. When Binance Coin was launched in 2017, hot diggity dog, it was pledged that 100 million Binance Coins, half of the total supply, would be removed from circulation through a burning process. This process will leave only 100 million BNB in circulation. The pledge is automatically fulfilled every quarter and calculated according to auto burn formulas. Cool. <clears throat> Continues happening. It's weird. The 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 altcoins are creeping in once again to the news. You remember, since January, we like only had Bitcoin news. And now we're getting Binance coin, XRP news. We're getting, uh, I mean, maybe thrice. We've had Terra Luna Classic news. Been getting a lot of Shiba Inu news again. Ethereum is also always lightly sprinkled in there. Uh, we had some Litecoin news as well. What other altcoins have been in the news? Maybe I, I, like I'm missing two more. Anyway, that's the Binance coin burn news. I guess if they keep doing it at this rate, the other rest of the coins will be gone in the next, I think, four to five years. So it sounds like a long time. It's not. 2017. It, it, it I remember 27. Like I remember like it feels like maybe a week and a half ago. Terrible. Okie dokie. Yeah. Let's move on. Also in the news, Metacomp PTE Limited. Okay. A forward-thinking fintech company, fantastic, headquartered in Singapore, has entered into a strategic partnership with Harvest Global Investment Limited, HGI, a renowned asset management firm based in Hong Kong, this collaborative effort aims to democratize access to HEI's latest innovation, cryptocurrency spot ETFs for investors not only in Singapore but across global markets. Yeah, so for those of you who have maybe missed the last couple of weeks or, or something like that, we're seeing a rapid expansion in the actual uh, purchasing of and not usage of but wanting of ETFs. So within the United States, there were already a number of other places that already had ETFs. As the American ETFs launched, other people began to also launch their own. We had news a couple of weeks ago that Hong Kong was going to do the same. And then Hong Kong a couple of days ago actually launched their uh, spot Bitcoin and spot Ethereum ETFs with no problem at all because that's how regulation actually works. People ask for something, you regulate it, and they end up getting it. Thanks a lot, Gary Gensler. The other side of it is that um, it is believed or we were told that the Hong Kong ETFs would actually expand access for ETFs and people looking to buy a securitized version of Bitcoin uh, around most of or all of Asia. The idea being if you have access in parts of the world to the Hong Kong Stock exchange, and therefore you would have access to their spot Bitcoin and spot Ethereum ETFs. And now this company is merging or trying to partner with another company. We've heard of Harvest Global before. I think they're I think they're one of the companies who actually has an ETF within Hong Kong, if I remember, because it's three companies who ended up having one. And now Metacomp 
PTE Limited is now trying to get them also listed within Singapore as well. The rumors are, and it's not been substantiated at all if you are in Hong Kong or if you know the actual truth to this, a lot of the rumors still floating around is that people within North, within China, are going to start to have access to this uh, securitized version of Bitcoin as well. So they're not actually dealing in Bitcoin and or using it as a currency, but they'll be able to use it through the, you know, the stock exchange and trading it in this sort of way. But once again, no one knows. I've heard various uh, stories where people are saying, yes, this is how people in China will be able to access Bitcoin and or no, it's still completely like a no-go. You would have to travel down to Hong Kong and simply do business there. But no one actually knows. So the expansion continues while uh, people were sad or annoyed or angry at the market falling in the last couple of like, 10 days, keeping in mind that we've basically doubled and or almost tripled in price in the, in the course of a year. Any downtrend disillusions people quite quickly. No, but the rich people are still trying to launch these things. They're also launching them. So some of them are launching. Some of them are still trying to get launched. And people are still interested. There, there's no real backtracking that we've seen. If we had, we would probably have a $30,000 Bitcoin right now, but this like downtrend that you see is quite normal. And I know it sounds weird and I can't really convince you in any sort of way. It's more of a, you need to have been here for multiple cycles to really understand the movements and the levels of market manipulation that these people do to make sure that they can buy at a lower price to simply like shake the tree. The point is to always get you out of the market. This is always their goal. I know it sounds insane. It's because it is. Rich people are kind of crazy. The entire point is, is to get poor people out of the market because rich people think that they can control. I mean, it's yes, that they can control the market a lot better. And I mean, control not as in like they're smarter. I mean, like, no, like literally control it to their whim so that they can make more money. So, yeah. Um, cool. We've had rumors about Bitcoin ETFs within Singapore before, as far as like them having their own spot Bitcoin ETFs. But I guess this is going to be the next step forward for it. So cool. That's the Singapore might get some of the Hong Kong ETFs listed uh, relatively soon, I guess. I'm still very excited. It, it's it's going to take about a week, like a good week to really gauge exactly how much um, popularity the Hong Kong ETFs have. The world currently, economically and mentally, is kind of all over the place. So I think I, the, I, I read some of the first uh, reactions to it a couple of days ago, and they were, what was it? People were talking about that the expectations were that they would be able to do roughly around like half a billion within the first couple of days. Uh, when they initially launched, I looked and they were new. What was it? I think they had done, I think, five or six million dollars worth of uh, volume, I think, within the first like hour or two of actually launching. So a week is usually a good period of time that we'll start getting news rolling in as how good they're doing. And if this has any effect on the U.S. ETFs as well in that Bitcoin is finite. And if these people in Hong Kong are buying tons of Bitcoin, that means less Bitcoin for the other people, essentially, in other markets uh, to be able to buy as well. So we'll see. That's the Metacomp Singapore Hong Kong Bitcoin ETF news. And yeah, let's move on. I try not to roll my eyes, and I and I wish more people did um as well because I, I i don't know what the solution to this is and not in like a joking way like i don't I, I i don't understand how you can be this openly corrupt and no one fights against you i i i don't know what the answer actually is um ripple ripple has filed an opposition to the securities and exchange commission's demand uh, for penalties, for those of you who have not been here, or in case you forgot, the US SEC, and it's only, it is only, it is only the US SEC 
who has a major problem right now with um, cryptocurrencies. Every other country who wanted to regulate has regulated. Every other country who wanted to ban it has banned it. And we live in relative crypto harmony except for the things because of Gary Gensler. So, I mean, super long story short, Gary Gensler has basically said out loud that he thinks that every single coin is a security and needs to fall under his jurisdiction. This includes Cardano, this includes Tron, this includes Solana, you name it. This also now, the, the, the umbrella's trying to also go on top of Ethereum, uh, but I guess not without a monetary fight behind the scenes. Um, we, I think, logically should have already come to the conclusion of the Ripple versus SEC lawsuit uh, in its entirety in that um, we know that XRP within the United States is now no longer seen as a security, regardless of, you know, what have you. Um, and this is now a very good metric for other coins to also base their coins off of to say, well, if XRP is doing one, two, and three, and we're doing four, five, and six, then clearly we're on the same exact level. This lawsuit has been going on since 2020, since the end of 2020, when the last chairman of the SEC filed a lawsuit against them in the most corrupt way ever on his last day in office. And I don't understand how these people don't get in trouble. It, that's clearly a sign of corruption. If you're doing it on your last day in office, are you a psychopath? The other part of it is, is that for those of you who've been missing it, I mean, it's not the most exciting thing ever, but the US SEC, while they're launching all of these lawsuits, um, have been trying to actually get money from these companies, and sometimes they actually do. The issue is, is that they're filing complaints against these companies, and instead of having to do a, a, a lengthy four, five, six year lawsuit process, they're simply like, okay, we'll pay the fine. But then the SEC has been saying, okay, you owe us $45 million. For what? You owe us 45 Okay, cool, we'll pay it. You owe us $90 million, you owe us $118 million, et cetera, et cetera. Those numbers are already obscene because the money that is then relinquished or from the fine is just simply given to the SEC and it goes into their pockets. It's never given. It's never given. It is never given to anyone who the SEC claims was harmed, air quotes, in any sort of way by any institution or company. If you say that a company has caused American investors blanket, blanket phrase, American investors to lose money and we're charging you $118 million, that $118 million is not going back into the pockets of anyone who was actually, and I air quote once again, harmed. The problem is, is that the SEC has completely lost their mind and they're going completely unchecked. And I assume it's because of the dystopian world that we currently live in. The US, so the, the reason why Ripple filed an opposition is because the SEC is demanding two billion, that's a two billion with a B, two billion dollars in penalties from Ripple. Do you remember the other video that I had? This was about maybe 10 or so days ago where we were going over uh, the corruption of Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan Chase, and that's not a tinfoil hat thing. Like, we know that to be true. And JP Morgan Chase... After, the, I think, the last 20 or 30 years, their levels of corruption are, are quite sky high to the point where they have had to pay $40 billion worth of fees and penalties for doing some of the most egregious things that we've ever seen in human history. The idea is that, simply put, that the US SEC believes that Ripple sold pieces of XRP to the public without registering with them and therefore have to pay $2 billion in penalties. I want you to put that into context. In a detailed motion made public by Ripple's defense lawyer, James Fallon, the company is disputing the SEC's proposed penalties as overly punitive. Ripple has therefore argued, they said, no, there's no way that we're paying you $2 billion, you very special people, and they're suggesting that they only pay $10 million instead. 
The filing emphasized that the requested $2 billion in penalties by the commission is not aligned with the actual circumstances of the case. If the idea is that in 2015-2016, they might have sold XRP to people living within the United States, do you think that's worth $2 billion? And for the person who just said yes, because there's always one, yeah, I heard you, Mr. Cheeky out there. Uh, don't forget that your altcoins that you're also holding are also deemed to be securities as well. So we know that uh, the US SEC is already planning on and has begun the process of taking other companies within the cryptocurrency space to court for the exact same thing. A lot of these coins... The coins, not the network, not derivatives, not other layer twos, the coins you hold, yeah, because they're crazy. They're, they're claiming that the companies who issued them, who made them, who created them are also probably going to be liable as well. What they're trying to do is knock out the top position, the most popular coins. There's a reason why they're going after Ripple and why they're going after the Ethereum Foundation, because if they can get those two dominoes to fall, then every other smaller coin will also fall as well. For those of you who do not remember, XRP used to be the number three coin, but over the course of the last four years of this lawsuit, of course, that has changed. Why do you think they're going after every other coin? Because some of them will buckle. The idea of even just paying $10 million dollars, and I say this in the most like dramatic movie kind of way, I would bring them the money in, 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 in one of two ways. In one of two ways. I would bring them the money myself in a gigantic truck that was all in pennies. You, 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 you think I'm joking. All in pennies, one cent pieces, and I would dump it directly on, their, on, on the footstep of their building. I'm not even joking. And, and, and I think it would be one of the greatest things in the history of ever. And or I would take $1 bills in multiple suitcases with me and my lawyers and I would throw it at them. Not the suitcases, but like each individual bill, like in their direction for them to pick up. Why is no one regulating the SEC? Why is the SEC the, the top of the pyramid for nearly all things finance within the United States? For those of you who didn't see the video, um, I think it was a day or two ago, we had news that the New York Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange is apparently looking to go 24-7. That is to say, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, simply because they're trying to find a way to increase their, their revenue streams as stock markets around the world are also looking quite shaky because of the world right now. Um, and then the news that we had was that apparently part of this or all of this will be decided by the SEC. Was there, was there something written or that I missed that was in the news that said that the SEC is God within the United States? That's not even a joke. Like, I, I'm actually asking. Because over the years, when you, when, you, when you do daily cryptocurrency videos and go over the news daily, something really interesting happens. Your, your brain maintains and retains all of this information. And from all that I can tell from the SEC, it's just been one gigantic uh, poop show. Even a couple of years ago, we had people from the, the, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the people who also were like, no, none of these. They, for those of you who missed it, there's the SEC and the CFTC. These are the uh, financial regulators within the United States. Uh, but the problem is, the problem is, is that the CFTC, so we heard in the news, only gets one-tenth, one-tenth the funding that the SEC does. And the CFTC wanted to regulate the cryptocurrency space a number of years ago, but the SEC, with a 90% more budget, uh, completely knocked them out of the way and said, no, we're going to do it instead. The CFTC said, no, there's no real problem. None of these coins or anything is actually a security. We would deem them as some form of a commodity, as a form of a currency. It's not legal tender, but they're still digital currencies in their own right and we will regulate them as such. Uh, but no, I... Don't get how people don't fight back. And, and I mean not just in a courtroom waiting for four years. I mean, who's going to be held liable for this level of corruption? That's an honest question. Because the issue is, and I've seen a lot of people talking about it on, on Twitter, 
is everyone is waiting for Gary Gensler to leave office. I believe it would be at the end of this year, if I'm not mistaken. But he's only going to be replaced by someone who's crazier than him. The, the, the people who get put into these positions, they usually are, are feral. And they, they show their worth to other people. Like, you don't get put into a position like this because you, you show how much more lenient you are than, than the last guy. No, you get put in because, you know, you're stronger and better. You're, you're, you're better, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I, I can show my worth. You have something to prove. But then it's like that'll also go unregulated. So, yeah. Um, I don't want to say the word popular news. It's more of a, this was a uh, <laughs> huge news story uh, simply because everyone's like, okay, $2 billion is absolutely incredibly insane. Ten million also shouldn't be paid to the SEC. They should be the SEC sh should be paying Ripple at this point. Like literally, pay me, send that money to my bank account, kind of situation. The silver light silver lining here is that um, if they're filing for like this motion, it appears that the lawsuit might be nearing an end because at the end of everything, typically comes money, at least within the states. So they're saying, okay, cool, after all these things that we've proved over the course of the last four years, we want $2 billion from you. And Ripple's now being like, no, we can give you 10 and then we're kind of done with it. We've heard from the company Ripple before that they're in talks with apparently dozens of companies and banks within the United States who want to use their products, who want to use XRP, who want to use the XRP blockchain, uh, but they're choosing not to because of the ongoing lawsuit. And Ripple also said that they plan on going uh, public as well as a company once this lawsuit is done. So we had news last year, I, and I mean exactly a year ago, from a lot of lawyers and things like that on Twitter and other places who were like, oh, yeah, the lawsuit's going to end in 2022. It's going to end in 2023. So there's no timeline for this. It just appears that as they're now talking about money, that we might be near... Uh, the end of all of this. And I think it'll be a gigantic win for the entire cryptocurrency space because it'll set a brand new precedent as to what can and what cannot happen uh, during a lawsuit with the SEC. But these people need to stop. And, and, and I say that just last thought uh, from, from the frame of why has this not happened in any other country? If, if you weren't here in 2018, 2019, uh, we were told by U.S. regulators and by the U.S. SEC that if, you know, the, the reason why other countries didn't have a Bitcoin ETF is because, it, no, like, and, and this is real as well, that it would ruin the economy, things would happen to so-and-so, this would be blah, 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 it's the worst things ever. And when we got the ETFs in Canada, I remember being like, sky still blue. A couple months later, I was like, has anyone seen a volcano in, in Canada yet? And then it got in multiple other countries and I was like, Ah, so the SEC and all the regulators were once again lying within the United States. Why why are we not why are we not getting news about Singapore and Hong Kong suing cryptocurrency companies for two billion dollars? Why has this not happened in Australia, in the UK? Anyway, yeah, that's the the lawsuit might soon be over. I'm not holding my breath, and I haven't for a while. When it's over, it's over. It cannot go on forever. It'll just be a gigantic win for Ripple and for altcoins as well. But yeah, really worried about the future of regulation if this is where we currently are right now. And no one's keeping any of this in check. Uh-huh. That's the SEC Ripple $2 billion news. Yeah, I think that's going to do it for this video. I do hope that you have all enjoyed. I do hope you all are having a great day, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I do hope it is absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching, listening, liking, commenting, and supporting and I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.